I'm showing Martin as, as not as being away at this point. Uh, do we I, need think, I think in these cases, once we start, I'll try and get them back. Yeah, but you just be keep good. going. That, that'll be good. I'm going to let you work on that. They can always watch it. If they don't come back, they'll have access to the video that they can watch later. Okay. All righty. Um, so uh, there he is. I see him. Uh, it shows green. Looks like they're trying to call back in. So, um, but anyway, uh, part of of the, the class uh, we wanted to do this uh, theology class again, uh, but also uh, Torben is um, uh, has been asked to serve as an elder in his church there in Denmark. They have a, a what's called a free church, and uh, it's a brethren church. Uh, so. Uh, we had talked about uh, about doing the Skype thing so that he could uh, get in get in on some uh, some things that would maybe be helpful along those lines. Are y'all back? We're back. Yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. We realize there may be some technical difficulties. I uh, just explained some of the stuff the the handout that I sent you is the lesson for today and the schedule uh, for the class. So you can look over those and then. Uh, we'll have notes for next week, and uh, but that'll kind of give you the reading schedule out of your basic theology, and uh, along with that will be the notes that we give each week. So, and that's all there is. The reading is is very little, but it's not light. It's uh, heavy reading uh, and things to think about. So, uh, with that, let's just have a word of prayer, and we'll we'll get started this this time. Is everybody uh, uh, anybody have any questions? On things. Yes, about the book. Why don't you say what book it is and if it's necessary? The basic theology book, the Ryrie basic theology book, is uh, necessary. It's good to have. Uh, a lot of the material comes out of the Ryrie basic theology with other things in addition in, in your notes. Uh, but the uh, Ryrie basic theology is a, a good tool to have and will be helpful to you. Uh, you can get them at our local bookstore uh, there at Christian Gifts Outlet in the mall. And that Kindle company. for $14. Okay, it is on Kindle. We were wondering if you could get it on Kindle. You can get it on Kindle as well for $14. Uh, it'll cost you a little more to get the hardcover book. Uh, they also have a paperback uh, book that's a little less expensive, I think. So, so this reading schedule is, is from that book then? Yes. Yeah, it is for the basic theology. So your reading on your reading schedule there, those chapters are for basic theology, Ryrie's basic theology. So, And then there's plenty of theologies out there, uh, and there's some good ones. So if you want to get Chafer's systematic theology or, or some uh, uh, Grudem's, uh, there's several that are, uh, you you know, you can take these topics up and, uh, and read uh, some of the different uh, subjects there. So, okay, any other questions? Well, let's pray and we'll get started. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And uh, Lord, uh, we love you and, and love your word. And, uh, and God, everybody that's here has a desire to know you in a deeper way. And we pray, Lord, that we might be able to stimulate one another in, uh, in our, our quest to, to know you and and to express our love to you, Lord, by, by knowing you in a deeper way. Uh, and we ask, Lord, that you would, uh, we acknowledge our dependence upon your Holy Spirit. Natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Uh, but, Lord, you have uh, been pleased to reveal things about yourself to us as your people. And we're so glad that you are our God and that we are your people and that you have made yourself known to us. Uh, so we pray that as we learn uh, things about you, uh, that it deepens our relationship with you and our love for you and our awe of your greatness. For you are a great, and mighty God. And we pray, Lord, that you would just bless our time together. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'm going to come up with the... Uh, uh, with our PowerPoint, our notes here, 
And you can follow along in your notes. Uh, should be, be good for, uh, uh, for the information that, that you uh, receive in the class. And um, So uh, let's begin. Uh, this is a study is a study of theology proper. And theology proper has to do with the person of God. It's, it's a great area of study in theology uh, because it's, it's at the essence, at the very uh, root of, um, of our, our Christian life. Uh, it's uh, the importance of, of knowing God. And the scripture says that this is eternal life, that we may know thee the one true God and Jesus Christ who now is sent. So uh, we're blessed to uh, have opportunity to uh, think about God, uh, to study God, the things that he's revealed about himself, and that's what theology property, proper is about. Uh, A.W. Tozer had this to say. He said, the heaviest obligation lying upon the church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is once more worthy of him and of her. So if we think, if we think about that, uh, what Tozer is saying is hugely significant. Uh, our lack of knowledge of who God is, of his person, of his character, of his greatness, of the, of the wonder of the exploration of, of this wonderful God that has made himself known to us and that sent his son and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and, and it was that we might behold his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, uh, when that knowledge of God decreases, then the effectiveness of the church, the, the, the reality of what the church is intended to be and God's, uh, God's plan and purpose is dimmed. Uh, but when God is exalted, when he is worshipped, uh, when he is acknowledged for the greatness of who he is, uh, then uh, the, the very concept of God is seen for, what he, for who he is and what it needs to be. And if there's anything that our country needs today and that the world needs today, it would be a, a greater reality of who God is. To know God is the very essence of what Christianity is all about. The, that unknown God that Paul spoke of in Acts chapter 17 uh, is, is the... Uh, is what has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And we behold God's glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. John. Yes, sir. When we practiced, you had that full screen over there. I did, but when I'm sharing here, it goes on to... Okay. Well, that's all that we're recording then. Oh, that's it's not how we practiced it. It had everything. Uh, oh, you mean it had this... No, it looked just like this on your screen. Yeah, I know. But because we're sharing with this screen, it went to, uh, what's this called? This is called... Uh, I think you can change that, though. It's presenter screen. Where you yeah, see it's presenter you screen. Uh, Do you yeah. know how to get out of the presenter screen? Uh, I, I don't, but I can work on it if we need to. Well, that's odd, because when we practiced, it was doing it the other way. So is that what's recording? Is that the deal? Okay. We're recording your screen, basically. My printer screen is what's to it is. How's there that? Go. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Yeah, that's, that's what we had, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that'll help for the, for the recordings. Ray, Ray uh, should be ready to join now. Is he? Uh, yeah, thank you. Did he uh, uh, join uh, Dennis there so he can sign him up? Here's other chairs in here, baby. Sean's coming. Ah. Y'all, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, A.W. Tozer also had this to say, before the church goes into eclipse anywhere, there must first be a corrupting of her simple basic theology. 
She simply gets a wrong question, a wrong answer to the question, what is God like, and goes from there. So uh, if, if we were to address the heart of the issue of the problem that is being faced in the church in the United States today, uh, and if we were to look back over the, the modernism and the uh, defection and the fall of the authority of Scripture, uh, the impact of, of Darwinism, and all of the assaults on, on the, the pre basic presuppositions of Scripture and the assault on Christianity. We understand that, uh, that it was prophesied. The New Testament is very clear that there would be this conflict, that there would be many antichrists that would arise, many false teachers. And if we were to look back at all of, of these things and we were to put our, our if we were to, to nail the central issue, the central issue would be here, is that the church has simply got, gotten the wrong answer to what is God like? Who is God? And so if we're going to uh, have any type of return or real revival in the church today, there needs to be a revival in this aspect, who God is, what the scripture has revealed about God, what we may know about him. And when he's presented in all of his beauty and all of his glory and all of his majesty, uh, then he will draw and, uh, and he will be desired uh, by those uh, that, that are called and those that will come to him. But the objective of the church, our objective should be to know God for who he is uh, and to answer this question, what is God like, by faith in the expression of, of trusting in the Lord and believing in his word and in the promises and all of those things that we have studied in our class in the book of Hebrews about faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But the things that he has revealed to, to us about himself in his word are essential in knowing God and in exalting God and in returning the church again to that which is most basic and most necessary in uh, our, our, uh, our journey as ambassadors for Jesus Christ, and ministers of reconciliation for Jesus Christ. So are there any questions or comments? Uh, you, you can notice here uh, much of the, the problem in, in, our, our, in the, the Christian church today, uh, the Christian entertainment church there, we won't speak of sin or repentance. Uh, sermons are full of love, and you can whistle, clap, and scream, hard rock, coffee, popcorn, no pulpit, no Bible, uh, bring money. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but that diminishing of the glory and the nature of God is, is uh, where our major problem is, and it's reflected, unfortunately, in, in so much of uh, worship in the Christian churches today, and there needs to be a return. Are we still, did we lose them? No, they went on mute. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I got a problem here now. What's the deal? Yeah, if you look over here. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, so this course, then, is an introduction to some of the major theological themes in theology proper. Okay, theology proper, again, is the study of the person of God and of his character. Theology proper is the investigation into what may be known of the existence, persons, nature, and characteristics of the triune God. Why do we say persons with a, with a S? <laughs> yes, right, triune God. Uh, but the nature of God is what? It's singular, and so we'll, we will uh, discuss in, in future lessons the Trinity and, and the revelation of God uh, in, the, in the Trinity. This course is designed to stir our hearts to worship the incomprehensible yet knowable God. Those are two uh, terms that uh, will show up in your 
future lessons here, that God is incomprehensible, that he's a transcendent God, that he is outside of his creation, uh, that there's the created order and there's God outside of that. Uh, we, we find that declaration in the beginning, God created. So we go back to in the beginning and there was God uh, and he uh, is outside of his creation, outside of all of his creation. And that term that we use is called transcendent. He's a transcendent God because he transcends the material world that we know. God is spirit. He transcends it. And he is uh, separate from it. And he's not a God that we can put in a box or, or define uh, from our, our perspective. So he has made himself known. He is incomprehensible in that he's transcendent and outside of his creation and yet he's knowable because he has revealed himself to us. And we want to stir our hearts uh, with one another to worship this incomprehensible yet knowable God. The scripture in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, let not a mighty man boast of his might, let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness and justice and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. And, uh, you know, don't you want to delight the Lord? Well, this, this passage of Scripture is telling us uh, what it means to delight the Lord. He delights in that declaration and that understanding that he is loving and kind and just and righteous and all of those things that we as his uh, children should declare him to be and uh, by faith uh, uh, commend and, and hold forth uh, that truth, that word of truth about God. So, okay, uh, uh, Lewis Spirey Chafer had this to say, uh, no worthy astronomer limits his attention to the findings of other men, but he is himself ever gazing into the heavens, both to um, both to verify and to discover, and no worthy theologian will be satisfied with the result of the research of other theologians, but will himself be others ever searching the scriptures. Uh, so I love that, that beautiful picture, and I think that God gave us the expanse of the heavens to declare the glory of God. Psalm 19 says that, and when we look at the expanse of, of heaven and we realize the tininess of our world and the tininess of mankind, uh, then we get uh, God has by nature given us a glimpse of his transcendence. His, uh, his incomprehensible uh, nature uh, and, and person. And so, uh, so I, I love the picture and I love what uh, Louis Spirit Chafer draws here, this, this beautiful search. And as a, an astronomer searches the, the, the heavens, which is, is, is simply, uh, it can be explored your whole lifetime and never explore all that is there and never even really scratch the surface. So I really believe that God gave to us the heavens that we might wonder at his greatness and acknowledge that the one who created the heavens is most certainly an unsearchable, incomprehensible God. Uh, secondly, the course, this course is designed to train students to think theologically and critically. Again, you know, I know this morning in the service we, we talked about the importance, the significance of, of doctrine and what it means to study the scripture and how that growth in the Christian life is based upon and sanctification takes place on the basis of, uh, of, of knowing the word, of knowing scripture. So that um, process, you know, where, where Jesus he prays the prayer, sanctify them uh, in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Uh, those are the things that we as God's people should hunger for and long for. So to, to be trained in, in the, uh, the study of the scriptures 
is to be trained like the astronomer in the exploration of the greatness of God. And here's what I think, folks. Uh, if we approach our study in Scripture uh, in terms of knowing God, that it'll never grow. It'll never grow tiring. It'll never grow boring. Uh, we'll never get tired of it. Uh, if we can just keep that focus, I want to know Him. I want to know God. And God makes Himself known, and He has these wonderful treasures in Scripture. Uh, in, in Proverbs, it talks about wisdom as being something that, that you dig for, like precious jewels and silver and gold. And, you know, if you if you see, ever, ever seen someone or the, or the uh, illustration of someone that has gold fever, they're just, there's a, a, a passion. They're controlled by this desire for this, these riches. Uh, and I, I truly believe that God wants us all to have, have gold fever for Him, for the person, the character, the nature of God. And uh, the greater our fervor and, 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 uh, and quest for that knowledge of Him, uh, the more He will reveal of Himself to us. And I do believe that He withholds those treasures uh, until we hunger for them the way that we properly should hunger for them and value them the way they should properly be valued. So uh, if, if this is our quest with, with theology and we're learning to think theologically and critically by our quest and, and uh, our journey through Scripture, then God will make Himself known to us in really beautiful and wonderful ways. And as we value Him and treasure that relationship, then, uh, then we will grow in that in a very, very special way. So uh, to be trained to think theologically and critically. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the Word with great eagerness examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. We have examples in the Scripture of those that, uh, that had that, that quest to, to dig into the Scriptures, to, to look and to put the authority of the Scripture where it needs to be. And you can just see the delight of the Apostle Paul here in Acts, in Acts chapter 17, when he speaks of these Bereans, and they, he says, they were more noble than the Thessalonica, the Thessal than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily. And you can see the treasure that the Apostle Paul put uh, on those and the commendation for those that are, that are students of, of God's Word. Next door we have um, the Iwana program going, and the Iwana program says, uh, study to show yourselves approved. Iwana, approved workmen that need not be ashamed. And that comes from that passage uh, to, uh, to study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a critical and theological thinking student of the word. That's what that means. And uh, that's, so that will be our pursuit in, in the study of theology. And it's, it's a, a pursuit well worth taking, a journey worth taking together. And it's exciting to take this journey with you uh, and have hungry people to gather around some hungry people that will uh, start a quest and a journey for these very things. Uh, number three, uh, in course objectives, is to survey the bi major Bible biblical teachings and theology proper, identifying the key passages and proper terminology for major doctrines. So, uh, this course is is with theology proper. In the future, we'll at uh, we'll at Add other uh, theology classes uh, after theology proper as, as bibliology, and that's the study of the, the Bible, the authority of Scripture. Um, and then there's, there's other areas like the work of Christ um, in redemption, soteriology, the deity of Christ. There's a there's a theology class that deals directly with the, the person of Christ and in the work of Christ. And there's pneumatology, which is the study of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's ecclesiology, the study of the church. There's these different areas of theology that we will uh, look into, hopefully in the future. Uh, 
uh, letter D or the uh, fourth uh, course objective is to defend the scriptures, uh, the tradition of the evangelical interpretation of these doctrines. Again, we want to know uh, what the teaching of Christ is and be uh, those that are faithful in holding forth the word of truth in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. These are the things that God has called us to. Uh, we're to, uh, to defend the scripture and uh, it says be ready to give an answer and that's a defense, an apology, apologia in Greek, which means to defend the scripture. Uh, so there's, there is uh, room, there's a, a call and place in the word of God uh, that we as God's people are to defend the truth of God's word. And that as these false teachers and false prophets would arise, that we as God's people would uh, address those issues. The fifth course objective is to expose and refute the errors of traditional and contemporary denials of these historic doctrines. So uh, one of the things, one of the reasons that I majored in systematic theology in seminary, I wanted to go to, when I went to seminary, I wanted to do systematic theology for one reason, and that was that if I, I knew that if I was going to be uh, in, involved in ministry, uh, that I needed to be able to identify uh, false teaching, uh, because the nature of the, of the world we live in and the times that we live in is the time that precedes, and, and, we're, and we're if we're not already there, have, are moving into, we've already moved into what is called the great apostasy or the great falling away. And we know that that great falling away, that great apostasy is going to take place before the man of sin is revealed, and prophetically speaking. There's going to be a period of time in which this great apostasy takes place, and then the man of sin is going to be revealed, and we're going to enter into a very terrible period of time in human history. And... Uh, identifying that battle that's that's in the church, these uh, admonitions that were given by John and the other apostles that says there are many antichrists that have already arisen, and they're, I, we told you that they're going to be there, and we know that that stuff is going to go through the church. It's gone through our seminaries, and we've seen over the years these uh, this defection from the faith in major evangelical, solid uh, seminaries and denominations. Uh, so exposing and refuting those dangers is necessary for us as God's people. Uh, we need not to be ignorant in the Scripture uh, because of the day and times that we're called to live in. Uh, so a study of systematic theology helps you. It categorizes truth in Scripture and helps you to recognize false teaching and those things which are damaging uh, to you and dangerous to the church. Uh, again, that the church might be beautiful in its relationship with the Lord and proclamation of who God is and in holding forth the word of truth in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So any questions on those objectives? Uh, are we good? Are we excited? Yeah. <laughs> Oh yes. Yeah. Be excited because uh, it is an exciting study, and and uh, you know if if we just might be by God's grace, you know His Spirit, knowing that His Spirit is here, He's with us as God's people, and He is instructing us, He's leading us, and teaching us in these things that are spiritual, that that are have been revealed through His Word, and as we lay hold of that, and as we feed upon those things. There's a spiritual growth that most assuredly will take place and a, a delightful thing that happens in our relationship with God as we uh, come to know Him in a deeper way and experience the greatness of God. It's transforming. And uh, so that's the, the objective. That's our goal. Uh, okay. Here we go. I've got a blank screen. <laughs> I have no idea what that's all about. Okay, that's really helpful. <laughs> um, let me just, I don't know what happened, Dennis. Move your mouse over here. You have, yeah. 
click on the next screen. I don't know why. It's I did. The, uh, there it is. Oh. Is that the next one? or? Yes, yes it is. is. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh well, I'm supposed to pull them up. Yeah. Well, I hit it. Th that was the third time that I hit it, so that's kind of odd. It's a little bit odd. But anyway, um, here's the thing. Healthy doctrine or healthy theology is always expected to result in holy living. Uh, when Paul prays for the churches, he prays for an increase in the knowledge, uh, for he realized that this would produce holy living, not only in creed, but in fruitful living, and holy living must be based upon healthy theology. This is so contrary to today. Uh, everything uh, uh, in our contemporary churches is, uh, is, again, as we were talking about this morning, well, what does this mean to me? And it's, it's me-centered. Uh, and here uh, we're, we're looking uh, for the exploration of God and His Word in such a way that it's, it's transforming and brings about uh, this uh, true and genuine sanctification. Sanctification doesn't take place by the strenuous efforts of flesh. Uh, we have uh, growth uh, spiritual growth takes place in a greenhouse. Uh, so when we come to understand that under the new covenant, uh, we've been, been given this, this wonderful, fresh, new thing in which Christ is, that we've been so identified with Christ that all of life flows from that identification. And that's why the Apostle Paul, like Lori is, is studying with the ladies this time around, the book of Ephesians. And in that book of Ephesians, uh, you know, just look at how many times it says in Christ and in Him. Uh, and, and this whole concept of being in Christ Jesus, that we, when we trusted in Christ, the Scripture says that we died with Him. Well, that's our position. And experientially, we don't feel like we died with Christ but the scripture says that when you put your trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, that you have died with him and that you've been resurrected with him and that you have been seated evenly, even in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That position of who we are in Christ is where the, the life comes from. So we get to Romans chapter 13 and Paul says, uh, you know, owe no man anything but to love one another. And by this shall, uh, uh, you know, by, uh, and is, this is the keeping of the law and under the new covenant. Uh, thou shall not steal, thou shall not commit adultery. All of these are covered within this one great commandment that Christ gave to us. And if you think about it, that love for Christ, uh, that love for God, and love for other people, uh, it, it nixes out. It, it's, it's so much higher than thou shalt not commit adultery. So in the energy of the flesh, and the strength of the flesh, we say, well, I shouldn't murder, I shouldn't commit adultery, I shouldn't do these things. And in the energy of the flesh, knowing the glory and the holiness of God, that's an awesome thing. And, and the scripture identifying the righteousness of God is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't give us the power. The power comes from that spirit which raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, quickens our mortal bodies, and the overriding principle is love. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And when you do, this is the fulfillment of the law. So living the Christian life is based upon this higher principle in Christ Jesus. And it's a wonderful, freeing thing that brings us to holy living uh, not by not only in creed and by statement of doctrine, but in the fruitful, uh, holy living that comes in Christ Jesus. He says, therefore, fervently love one another. And, and then it goes on to say, because um, uh, all flesh is like grass and like the flower of the field, so it flourishes. The wind passes over and it is gone, but the word of God endures forever. That living word within God's people is powerful and transformed. It's just, that's the way it is. That's where the life is. That's where true, holy living comes from. How theology affects my life or your life is our personal and individual responsibility. But to conform our lives to the image of Christ is the ultimate goal in studying theology. 
Yet in the final analysis, no book can do that. Only God can and you can. So there's this relationship that we have. And all of these challenges in Scripture uh, commands are given to us that we might, in accordance with God's will, uh, act by choice with our will in unity with God's purposes for us and know the glory of the promises of God that have been given to us as God's people. And we can know that reality in the Christian life. So A.W. Tozer had this to say that we do a quote from other people, by the way. We had Lewis Spirit Chaper, but uh, wonderful stuff. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, I just want to uh, take a moment to commend Lori. She, she went in and worked this thing, and I had all of these kind of lame pictures up there and all this <laughs> stuff together, but she has done an amazing and outstanding job in this presentation, and I, I sure am thankful for you, Lori. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, you can give her a hand. <laughs> so, the decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought about our troubles. A rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way toward curing them. It is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right while our idea of God is erroneous or inadequate. If we would bring back spiritual power to our lives, we must begin to think of God more nearly as He is. I don't know if that is in your notes, if we included that. Some of these we don't. But you can get, you can go online and get all of the Tozer quotes you want. You can find that in the knowledge of the holy. But I've loved that quote and gone to it many times in the past. Uh, uh, because this, that's a powerful quote, uh, quote. The decline of the knowledge of the holy and it comes, again, from his book. And uh, that rediscovery of the majesty of God is our quest. And let's make it our deliberate quest. And I would like to ask you uh, to pray through the week that, uh, that when we come together next week and in the following, in the, in the preceding weeks that, that uh, unfold, uh, that we have a genuine quest as a group of people to, to know God, a, a rediscovery of the majesty of God, and this should be uh, the major focus in uh, what we would do in theology proper. Or Martin, are they here with us? Are y'all there? They're on mute. They're I'm on here. Mute. You're there, good. Okay, I didn't know if you were still with us or not. So that, that was Ray, but Ray can't see the slides. Oh no! No, uh, I've only I've only got pics of uh, the folks on the call. Yeah. Right. If you're on an iPad. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Group Skype does not work on an iPad yet. Okay. I'll have to uh, get on a computer for the next call then. Sorry about that. Cool. Ray, it's good to hear your voice. It's great to hear yours, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, we were excited. I was so excited to hear that you might be joining us. Yeah, um, I'm excited to be on the call. Sorry it was late, too. That's okay. That's all right. We're just, just glad to hear your voice and want to welcome you. Thank you, Jim. Okay. All right. So prolegomena, that's a big, long word and all this kind of stuff, but it's, it's prolegomena is, is the area of study today. And, and prolegomena simply means this. It's the preliminary or introductory materials. It's basically uh, this uh, field of study that, that lays out terminology. This was uh, really important when I, I taught these classes in, in uh, Moldova because they were in a, uh, sometimes a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh language. Uh, and these students were amazing, but they needed uh, some of the terminology. And sometimes I realized that, that I may be throwing around things like bibliology and, and ecclesiology and those kind of things. Those are, those are theological terms. So what we want to do in prolegomena this week is identify some of those terms for you that will help in our future studies in the, in the areas of theology uh, because they're simply terms that have been used to define things and describe things in regard to theology. So prolegomena or what we're looking at uh, at this point has to do with these, these preliminary or introductory materials into a field of study. It includes the presentation of definition of terms. 
again earlier when I spoke about ecclesiology. Well, that's a Greek term for, uh, for the church. Uh, and so it was used to, to categorize the area of theological study that has to do with the church. So in systematic theology, when you're studying that particular area, that term is often used. And then the affirmation of basic assumptions. So in prolegomena, we have definition of terms. We have the affirmation of basic assumptions, things like the authority of Scripture. Uh, we, we're, gonna, we're going to, uh, in our study in theology, the, the basic uh, assumption is that the Scripture has, has spoken authoritatively. God has spoken through His Word, and we can learn things about God through the Scripture, through the Word that He's spoken to us. And the Scripture teaches that, that uh, the Word of God is, uh, is given by inspiration of God. That means it's God breathed, the Holy Spirit breathed it through people. Uh, Peter taught that uh, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so our understanding, the basic assumption, is that even though men uh, uh, wrote these letters and books, uh, that the Holy Spirit in, imposed uh, that revelation about God through holy men. They spoke as they were moved by God, and Scripture is given by inspiration. So some of these basic assumptions are, are necessary uh, for learning about God and for our, our studies. Identification of methods of study. We'll look at some of the, the different areas of study and theology, and we'll lay some of those out for you today. And in a statement of resources for study, um, you know, again, there's, there's different theologies. Uh, you you want to be careful with what theologies you get, uh, but Ryrie's Basic Theology is a good, uh, more practical book. Some of them will, will uh, be a lot deeper as far as some of the terminology and and they'll, they'll, they'll uh, spend more time with, uh, in the Greek and Hebrew languages and things like that. Uh, uh, so, but there are different sources that you can, can use in your study of theology. Uh, listing of special requirements. Uh, and uh, then we'll explain more of this later, but delineation of parameters of study. Uh, you know, like today we're studying theology proper, and that's about the character and person of God again. So uh, theology is the study, and we're, here we're defining the terms and looking at, again, at some of these parameters of study in this area, and prolegomena, that again is, is what we're, we're looking at. But theology is the study or science of God, including His works and relationship with His creation. Uh, so if we, if we break down the word theology, it's taken from two Greek words. Theos means God, and logos means word or speech. So it's the word about God. Theology is a study of God, uh, and, uh, and that's uh, where we get the terminology explains the, uh, the, uh, the pursuit or the area of study. It's science of God. Christian theology, then, is the rational interpretation of God and His works there in your notes, uh, Ray? Yes, Jim. Yeah. Hey, we have notes, and uh, and uh, I've got your email address now. We'll we'll be sure and send those or get Martin to, to forward them on to you. I yeah, will do. I did. About oh, you did? Yeah. You, Martin, you're a good man, despite what everybody says. I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So Christian theology then is the rational interpretation of God and his works as they relate to the Christian faith. It's, it's that area. Uh, and then there's types of Christian theology. It's, it's uh, again, as we explore the parameters of these different areas of study, uh, it can be cataloged in three ways. By error, that's not error, E-R-R-O-R, -R -O -R, but E-R-A, error. <laughs> so... Uh, one of the, the areas of theology uh, has to do with studying different eras, uh, and that some of the terms for that are like patristic theology. Now, what would patristic theology be? Can someone Church gander? Fathers. Church fathers, yes. 
Absolutely. Patristic theology is a study of, of some of the church fathers that had writings about the New Testament, about the apostles, about the beginnings of the church. And so there's a, a whole area of study in theology that has to do with, with what the patristic fathers had to say uh, about Christianity in those first uh, areas of study. There's also medieval theology. What would that be? That'd be a, an era, a period of time. In the medieval uh, period of time, uh, the, what we call the Middle Ages, there were those that, that, uh, that wrote and uh, some, some incredible great minds in the church that had uh, things to say and teach about God. Uh, then there was Reformation theology. What would Reformation theology refer to? Theology of the Reformation. <laughs> yes. So what is the Reformation? It was the return to the authority of Scripture. Okay. And all that, all the implications. It was an attempt to reform the Catholic Church. Okay. Luther, Calvin, Zwingling, Zwingli, Melanchthon. Yeah. Yes. Era. Yeah. So we had a, a, a real period of time where there was a reaction to uh, the doctrinal uh, uh, decline that took place in in the Catholic Church became the Roman Catholic Church, and, and then the reaction to that defection from the the heart and principle and truth of the gospel uh, was addressed by these great reformers, uh, and it was a necessary thing to take place in the church. So there's Reformation theology, uh, there's Catholic theology, there's Bartian theology. Liberation theology. What is liberation theology, Lyle? <laughs> yeah, you experience a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. The political movement, basically. Yeah. A lot of the liberation theology is, it really gets down to communism when it gets finished. Okay. So in liberation theology, what is, is their basic view of, of God and of, of salvation? Humanism, basically. Yes. Okay. So with liberation theology, it means that uh, it's, a, it's what we call the social gospel. And it's basically a, a statement that, that what's wrong with humanity has to do with the, the, the wrong that's in the injustice that's in a society. So if we can uh, educate people and if we can raise their standard of living, there will be salvation salvation out of this social change. So liberation theology is not something that we'd want to spend much time with if we want to know God. Uh, but nonetheless, it's an area of, of theology and, a, and, a, and an area of, of great defection from the truth. Uh, and it's expressed uh, with uh, you guys that are going with E3 ministries down into Mexico and Martin that's there in Mexico. Uh, uh, and in the Central America and South America, there's a, it's a, a huge movement and has infiltrated the evangelical church and does incredible damage uh, and, and is a, a great statement on the reason why we need to be theologically solid and sound and be able to recognize uh, these movements that take place in the church. Again, we could look at other areas, things that are going on in the church in the United States, like prosperity theology. What was what would prosperity theology be? Name it and claim it. Name it and claim it. Well, that's word of faith. Prosperity theology means basically that that uh, uh, God wants you rich and healthy. Rich and healthy. You ought to be rich and healthy. And if you have enough faith. God is going to make us rich and healthy. And if you're poor, it's a reflection of your lack of faith. That's correct, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a terrible error that's caused a lot of damage in the church and is false teaching again. So we want to, to be able to recognize uh, these things, and sometimes these different errors uh, and viewpoints are, are different areas of study. So we not only have error, but we have uh, viewpoint, Arminian theology, and Calvinist theology, Calvinistic, and some people are going, well, what is Calvinistic and what is Arminian theology? And uh, uh, But these these areas are, are different uh, uh, 
uh, areas of theology, Catholic theology, Bardian theology, liberation theology, uh, those are, are uh, theology by viewpoint. Uh, and so just to throw it out there again, what is, uh, what is Arminian theology? And what is the difference between Arminian and Calvin theo Calvinistic theology? Arminian places, Arminian theology places the emphasis on man uh, in the areas of salvation and is weak on the sovereignty of God and strong on the autonomy of man. Calvinism is stronger on the sovereignty of God uh, and specifically in his working uh, in, in all of his creation, but also in, in salvation, God's sovereignty and salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one difference. Yeah. Yeah, there's a number of different areas that with Arminian uh, often in uh, the areas of Arminian theology, uh, there's the central belief that one can lose their salvation. Calvinistic theology, the, there's the eternal security of the believer. And some of these different areas are uh, prescribed uh, or described in, in these, uh, these areas of study of theology. Uh, and uh, so uh, we may have opportunity to discuss some of those areas in the future. But also look at focus here, focus in your notes, historical theology, biblical theology, systematic theology, apologetic theology, exegetical theology, all of these different areas. And uh, we can look at those. I know it's a lot of terms, and some of you are familiar uh, with these terms, and some of you uh, may have no idea uh, what they're, they're about, but... Uh, uh, we'll talk about them from time to time. You can look at them in your notes, and uh, uh, we'll, uh, we can have discussion as well on some of these areas. But let's move on uh, in our notes to systematic theology. Uh, systematic theology is the collecting, scientifically arranging, comparing, exhibiting, and defending of all facts from any and every source concerning God and His works. Now, I believe that's from Lewis Berry Chafer, quote, uh, yes, it is. Uh, so systematic theology deals with this collecting. And the thing about systematic theology is it includes every area. In other words, God has revealed himself through his word, right? Uh, and he's made things known about himself. But God also, the scripture says, has revealed himself through his creation, hasn't he? Well, can we study God? Can we learn things about God in theology? In systematic theology, would it be right and is it okay to, to learn things about God and explore things about God through nature? What does Psalm 19, verse 1 say? Anyone quote that for me? Heavens declare the glory of God and the earth show of His handiwork. Yes, the heavens declare the glory of God. Our Creator is revealed, and this, we call this natural revelation. We'll talk about that a little bit in the future here. But God is revealed in His creation. And there are things that we can learn about God. In fact, Romans chapter 1 says that those that have not heard the gospel are held accountable by God, to God because that which may be known of God is manifested within them. There's an innate understanding of the creation in regard to their creator, and they're actually held accountable uh, in, uh, in, in relation to what God has revealed about himself uh, through his creation. Uh, so we can study God and learn things about God in these different areas. Yes, sir? Is, is that what you mean in the definition here where you say uh, facts from any and every source? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and what we mean by that is that, is that uh, my understanding in the pursuit of systematic theology is that we can uh, learn things from all of these different areas, from what people are saying, what, from what the church taught and, and the whole process that the church went through. Uh, for instance, in, uh, in the term that's used, trinity or triunity, well, that term's not in the Bible. Uh, it was... It was uh, it was studied, and because of, of conflict, you see, uh, when these false teachers would arise, then it, there would be need for the church to address these issues. And as they did, the process has been an unfolding of doctrinal truth. And 
and statements that are made, sometimes creeds that were stated in regard to doctrinal truth that was uh, exposed because of error that came into the church and godly men rose up studying the scripture and addressing the issues and, and, uh, uh, and arranging these facts about God, about scripture, about uh, truth, and sometimes assigning terminology like bibliology, ecclesiology, and all of these things to these different areas. So what we're saying in our study in systematic theology is that it's appropriate to use these different sources, things that have happened in the church through history and all of these different areas, to know and explore and learn about God. Yes, sir. So, Jim, what you're saying is that there are studies or schools of theology that are more narrow in what they're considering of the facts that reveal God. Yes, that sir. Systematic theology is a broader uh, than some of the other studies. That's... That's exactly right, and if you look in your, your notes here, you know, we're going to look at biblical theology. Biblical theology is addressed okay. strictly to Scripture and strictly to the progressive revelation of Scripture through the Bible. So, yes, there are, are narrower areas of the study of theology, and uh, some people uh, just don't agree that, that you should use systematic theology. They would say you, you should use only biblical theology. Uh, and they have reasons, good reasons for that. Uh, but we hold and believe that systematic theology is appropriate. And systematic theology is basically this. If you, if you just think in terms of the information that you receive, that, that we have file cabinets full of folders that categorize information. Why? Because we need it. Uh, because that's the nature of who we are. And systematic th theology is just the study in such a way that we're doing those things. With these different topics, different areas of study, uh, we have compartments, folders of, of study that are filed away in systematic theology so that we might know God in that kind of way. Okay? Does everybody understand? That was, thank you for that clarifying statement. Uh, Alan, that's exactly what we, we needed. And it's, yes, sir. So you would say systematic theology is that cabinet file drawer, and when you pull that drawer out, these are in the file. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, it's like your it's file cabinet. Right. You can look at that big file cabinet downstairs, right. but don't look too close. <laughs> but, uh, but in that file cabinet are these different topics uh, in alphabetical order, uh, and that's the systematizing of information, and that's what we're doing with systematic theology. And we, we think that it's a, a completely legitimate area and way to study and know about God in all of these different areas. Is it like yes. topical, but organized? Uh, <laughs> yes, it is topical because we're taking themes in er particular areas of study, and we're combining not just one specific area of study, but but what, the, what all of Scripture has to say about it and combining all of those things to, uh, uh, to balance out and to, to get the big overview of what God has revealed about himself. So, yes. Okay. Jim. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, just I had a question. Yes, sir, Martin. Um, so, but how do we, uh, maybe that will come later on, prioritize certain, if you want to know about heaven, for example, you've got the Bible, but then you've got people's testimonies that they claim they went to heaven and all that. So I just, uh, what, what do you say to that or how does that work? Uh, yeah, well, Martin, if you would have read your basic theology today, <laughs> <laughs> if you would have read your first three chapters like you were supposed to, if, if, <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's a, no. Actually, that's an excellent question, and uh, the thing is, and we're going to uh, talk about that and address it. And those of you that read uh, your your Ryrie study, how would you address that that question? What do we do with experience? Back it up with scripture. It has to be backed up with scripture. So the answer to that is. Uh, that our authority is always going to be the Word. We can look at those things and evaluate those things uh, that some kid is saying about what he believes about heaven, but the authority comes from Scripture. 
and we don't base authority on on uh, on experience. We don't base it on tradition. Uh, we don't base it upon uh, and these these different areas. But the authority comes from the Word of God. So everything is evaluated uh, as far as authority in regard to spiritual realm and spiritual issues on the basis of what God has revealed about himself and we're very careful and we will talk about this uh, and uh, we'll talk about it more in detail uh, about the dangers of, of looking to different people's experiences uh, to, uh, to, to discover truth. Yes sir. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm sorry he had a follow-up. You have a follow-up? Well yeah I just want so the difference between systematic theology and then the ones that, what would you call it, biblical theology? Biblical theology, yes. Yeah, is that the biblical theologist, he wouldn't even consider and evaluate those testimonies. Uh, well, yeah, I think so. I don't, I don't think it wouldn't be that, I mean, I think everybody has to evaluate that, uh, but he would simply evaluate it on the basis of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the progressive revelation in the Bible, uh, they would not explore or, or spend time uh, theologically uh, in in those those areas. But I, I do think I don't think it's impossible, even for one that embraces biblical theology, not to have to address uh, the very questions that you're asking. I think that the point is that uh, that in the study. Uh, and the evaluation that, of course, we always go back to the Scripture uh, as our authority. Uh, okay. And so systematic theology does not mean that we're taking a authority outside of Scripture or anything that would uh, be contrary to the teaching in Scripture. Okay, great. Thanks. Yes, sir. That's good for, for clarification. Thank you, Martin. Your question? Yes, and then basically the same thing. So is it fair to say that systematic theology must kneel to biblical theology, that all the things considered in systematic theology are, are evaluated uh, through biblical theology? Ah, that's good, man. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, Jim, in yes, agreement sir. with what he's saying, on your paper below systematic theology, you have biblical theology, you have dogmatic uh, you have natural theology. Mm -hmm. In all of those specific theologies, there's truth, and in some, there's error. Systematic theology looks at each one seeking the truth. Mm -hmm. They're looking at systematic, will look at natural theology, revealed theology. All of the theologies are considered under systematic, whereas the other theologies, they would look only at natural theology or only at dogmatic theology or something like that. Yes. Yeah, so what's what's really wonderful about this discussion is that it's going exactly where we're going here. Uh, and it's important and we did I did uh, in the notes here in my notes uh, want to uh, explain the and, and Ryrie addresses this in your reading. He addresses the, the necessity of, of exegesis, exegetical study, and the study of theology and the balance of those two things as being necessary in our, our study of, of God. And so we can take like a doctrine, like eternal destiny, and it says, uh, for in as much as it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. Uh, but as we study the overall big picture of Scripture, we find that there's the Bema Seat of Christ, and we find that there's the White Throne Judgment. And so in, in the scope of that once to die and after that the judgment, uh, there's the judgment of believers at the Bema Seat of Christ, where rewards are given out, and there's certain aspects and facets of that that we find in Scripture. And then we look in Revelation, and we find the Great White Throne Judgment, and that's where all the unbelievers are judged for their works at the great white throne judgment. And Jesus speaks in, in the Gospel of John that, that all authority has been that the authority has been given in him to judge, and that there would be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. And at that resurrection, that, that he, you know, these pictures and looking at, at systematic theology and looking 
uh, at, at the overall picture, there's the combination of these facets. So when we look at Hebrews, uh, as we studied recently, and we look at nine, Hebrews 9, 27 there, in as much as it's appointed that a man wants to die, and after that the judgment, we learn more about this judgment, and we learn facets of the judgment as we study and explore the Scriptures, and we find the Bema Seat of Christ, we find the White Seat uh, Throne Judgment, and we find the judgment of the angels, and all of these different uh, aspects of, of uh, this theological truth. So you understand? So we need to study the Scripture, to study the verses. We need to know what Hebrews 9.27 says, but in evaluating that and packaging it and putting it together, we need these other passages of Scripture and what they've revealed about judgment as well, don't we? So that's, this is what uh, Ryrie is speaking about in basic theology, about the importance of theology and exegesis. They must go hand in hand together. You know, they're, they're both important because uh, what has been revealed to us needs to be uh, described. It's, here's, here's a statement for you. Theology and exegesis should always interact. This is Ryrie's statement. Exegesis does not provide all the answers to that when there can legitimately be more than one expected option, theology will decide which to prefer. Was this in Ryrie? Yes. Yeah, y'all read this, right? Yeah. Uh, some passages, for example, could seem to teach eternal security or not. One's theological system will decide, on the other hand, one theological system uh, should be so hardened or could be so hardened that it is not open to change or refinement from the insights of exegesis. Okay? So you understand what's being said there? We explore what the Scripture says, and the Scripture is always true. But when we come to certain passages, and I remember very clearly coming to the passage, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to one day. Well, I was confused. How, what is, how is it that, that all of a sudden i got to work out my own salvation in fear and trembling here? Because I thought salvation was a free gift that God gave, and we believe, we trusted in in Christ. Well, the context of the passage, of course, is that the, the process of sanctification in the believer's life means that there's a working out, a prayerfulness, a pursuit of obedience to God's Word and the transformation that takes place as we pursue God's Word. And so in fear and trembling and humility to the declared truth of God's Word, we bow our knee and we pray and we seek God. And God transforms us because the Scripture says, it's very clear, it is God that works in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So we find this reality of how these things meet. Well, some people read that verse and say, well, you can lose your salvation. See, if you don't work out your own salvation, and if you don't do these works, then you're lost. But the, the Scripture says it's God that works in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So we see this match of 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 that uh, salvation being worked by God, giving us the desire. His Holy Spirit gives us the desire to do what's right. And then he gives us the power to do what's right. And all salvation comes from God. So even in our sanctification, it is by faith that we trust in the declared word of God and the reality of that truth becomes, uh, becomes real in our lives and in our experience on the basis of faith. So when we struggle, when we're working out our own salvation, we confess our sin and we declare uh, and we come to that, that sacrifice that has been made by Christ Jesus for us and we know the reality of those things. And exegesis is what clarifies and theology, uh, uh, looking at these passages and discovering and exploring the context in relation to other verses helps us to understand our theology does affect how we exegete and look at a passage. Because, you know, you could come up with the, uh, those different interpretations and people have in regard to working out your own salvation. If you don't work out your own salvation, you're lost. Okay? And so well, what does that mean? If you uh, trust or believe in Christ, you receive eternal life and it's a free gift. Well, how is that that you work out your own salvation? How do those things fit together? And theology 
And, and exegesis of Scripture helps you to, to come to those solutions. And the application of reason and the study of God's Word does all those things. We have to move on here, don't we? Eternal destiny is eternal on earth. Okay, we'll uh, move on. Biblical theology is the theology taken from the study of the various books of the Bible. Okay, now biblical theology is a study uh, that in its purest form seeks to rationally discover, integrate, and declare only what the Bible says about God as each book is interpreted in its historical and cultural setting. So, uh, you know, you, you uh, certainly uh, cheer on the biblical theology guys. They're, they're, they're doing a great work, and there's, uh, uh, you know, some benefit. There's great benefit to, to the, the authority of Scripture and holding to, to that pure form of the study of theology. That's just that in systematic theology, uh, you know, again, the bigger picture, natural revelation in those areas, uh, I believe, are, are necessary. But biblical theology traces the progressive revelation about God. In the Old Testament, we had certain things revealed about God. Uh, Moses wanted to know God. He wanted to, and, and, and God in this law gave his righteous character and the nature of God. And we see his holiness. And, and what it does is it brings us to uh, the place of accountability. And, and, uh, and as Paul declared in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Because he's looking at the law. And he said, we, we come to the end of ourselves and the end of any hope in man saving himself. Uh, and then it goes on to say, but uh, being justified freely through, his, through the propitiation that's found in Christ Jesus, uh, that, that God's salvation, uh, when we come to the end of ourselves, is found uh, through the provision in Christ. Now, dogmatic theology in your notes is theological truth held with certainty. From the Greek word doikimo, me, and means uh, I have come to the conclusion. Me is, is the, the personal pronoun, uh, and uh, uh, doikin or dogma is decree or ordinance or decision or command. In other words, when it says in, in, in uh, Augustus sent out a decree, that word is the word for dogma. Okay, so dogma is, is a decree or ordinance or command. Uh, dogmatic theology is a study of those dogmas. It's a study of doctrine, in other words. Okay, so if we look at it, uh, uncha the unchanging emphasis in the scriptures upon dogma uh, uh, or upon doctrine, which is subject to and reference to the New Testament more than 40 times, is that to which a Christian is to take heed. It stands as a silent rebuke, whether heated or not, to all modern notions which belittle the importance of dogmatic theology. And it also stands as a corrective to those who neglect any portion of it. So what he's saying there is doctrine is important. The very things, things we were talking about this morning. Uh, and, and when we looked at, looked at that, uh, that passage in, in 2 John uh, 1, 9, where... Uh, uh, there, there's the warning that's given from those that defect from the doctrine or the teaching of Christ. Uh, so doctrine and dogma, dogmatic theology is a, a term that's despised by the liberals. They just, they don't like it. And uh, to talk of dogma is just, man, it's like you get this from people. Uh, so uh, the thing is that dogma and dogmatic theology, those things that we plan our feet on and we're ready to die for, uh, are, are the things that are given to us, the truth that's given in Scripture that God wants us to firmly hold to. It's, the, it's building our house upon the rock. That's our dogma. It's, it's that which causes stability. It's that which, which uh, is a defense against the the Antichrist and the false teachers and all of the false things that come and, uh, and will protect us uh, from those things which we addressed and spoke of this morning uh, in third uh, in Second John where uh, we're given anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the doctrine 
he has both the Father and the Son. So God's teaching his word is the dogma to which we plant our feet on. It's where we stand. Here's some, some verses. He says there's more, more than 40 times in Scripture. I'm going to go through these quickly. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus in order that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. And that word, uh, 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 didasco or teaching, uh, hetero, is false teaching or false doctrine. Uh, and so, uh, let's see, we've got the transliteration there for you. I need a pointer, don't I? Uh, but as you can see on the screen here, uh, that's hetero, or other, or strange, strange doctrines, hetero, other doctrines. And this didasco is the teaching. It's a word for doctrine or teaching. Okay, so didaskalia. Uh, in pointing to these things, brethren, uh, there are 1 Timothy 4.6. Uh, you will be a good servant in Christ Jesus, constantly nourishing on the words of faith and the sound doctrine. Uh, there's a number of passages here, um, and they're, they're uh, provided for you in your notes. So I'll let you look at them. I'm going to move on very quickly here. Uh, again, the, the, uh, the uh, preach the word, preach the, the doctrine, the truth of, of Christ uh, and God's word. Um, let's see. Historical theology is the theology that traces the development of doctrine through the history of the church. It's cataloged by chronological periods. Uh, and that would include, you know, again, medieval theology, modern theology, Reformation theology, uh, individuals or groups, Calvinistic theology, special emphasis, covenant theology, dispensational theology, uh, charismatic theology, all of these different areas of special emphasis. Again, those are in your notes. You can look at those. Uh, then we come to practical theology, and practical theology is the application of theological truth into the actions of men, like in witnessing how we apply uh, the gospel uh, to witnessing and preaching, uh, in discipleship, uh, in counseling. Uh, the exercise of, of practical theology is the, the practical application of these truths in these different areas of discipleship within the church. Natural theology is the discovery, systematization, and presentation of theology as it's revealed in nature. Uh, so natural theology has to do with God's creation and the things that we can learn. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. And so in that declaration, when we look up at the stars at night and we see the vast, immense, uh, overwhelming uh, uh, beauty of the heavens, and we realize the tininess of the world in which we live and the tininess of of each individual person that's been created in the image of God with all of his value and all the merit of, of what God is doing through mankind, uh, he is overwhelmed by the nature of God's creation and by these things. And, uh, and it's, it's, it gives us perspective in the greatness of our Creator, greatness of our God, sometimes called general or prelapsarian. What is prelapsarian? What would that mean? Pre yeah, pre, what does diluvian mean? Flood. flood. Pre-deluge, uh, before the flood. So uh, there are things that we learn in nature. There was no Bible back then, uh, but there was still knowledge of God. There was still truth about God. There were still things that they could know. Uh, so there was uh, natural theology. The revealed theology is the theology that's discovered in the Scripture. That's what God has given to us. Now, God gave, uh, at times, visions to people. Uh, he spoke to Abraham. Uh, uh, there were prophets that were given special revelation. And those, that special revelation, those things were recorded for us in the Scripture and passed on and given to us. But revealed thought theology covers all of those things all of the many special ways that God revealed truth about himself. Okay, sometimes called special or post-lapsarian. What would post-lapsarian mean then? After the flood. 
Yes, post or after the fall. Lapsarian means, uh, yeah, the yeah it should be after the fall, uh, after the lapse. Yeah, so uh, pre and 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 post. So uh, so it should be after the fall. That's a, an error. Okay, you might correct that in your notes. Lapsarian is fall. Uh, pre and post. Lapsarian means before and after the fall. <coughs> epistemology is the branch of philosophy that is concerned with the theory of knowledge. When we talk about epistemology, it's how you can know truth, the nature and source of knowledge, the bounds or justification of knowledge. How can we know and how can we know truth are the things that we consider. Uh, we have in your notes there a, 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 just a theological review uh, and for time's sake, of course, we're going to skip that. Uh, but uh, these different areas, you can look at them in your notes and review them. Uh, but this is how it works together. Uh, Ryrie put this really well together in your chapter there. But theology is the discovery and systematization and presentation of the truths about God. Okay, so he basically says the same thing that Lewis Berry Chafer says. And then historical theology accomplishes this by focusing on what others throughout history have to say about these truths. Historical theology looks at, at what the church says. It looks at the study of the Trinity. It looks at the study of, of biblical prophecy. And, and it's, it's important to understand that these things progressed through church history, and there were ebbs and flows. When Reformation theology uh, came about when the Reformation took place, uh, there was a return to the basic and central truth of the gospel. Uh, and, it, and it was these battles in the church. Uh, in my day at seminary, there was a, a major uh, battle on, on, uh, on the gospel. What is the gospel? Uh, and there was uh, these, these different uh, camps that were we're wrestling over uh, um, these uh, different uh, uh, proclamation of, of the gospel. I'm trying to think of the term. Uh, Lordship salvation. Lordship salvation. It was, um, uh, it was a major area, and he had these different camps that were, were talking about, well, is this Lordship salvation, or is it, uh, you know, what, is, uh, what are the terms of, of actual salvation? How do we present the gospel clearly, uh, and that was a battle, you know. So you're you're looking at well, it's the 21st century, you know, maybe, or it was the 20th century back then when I was in seminary. But you know, uh, again, these battles have have taken place through the church, and the clarification of these issues uh, they come around and they they come and go, and Gnosticism uh, has appeared in the church, prosperity theology, uh, not much of what's declared there has been declared. Uh, has been uh, uh, just, it's simply Gnostic teaching that happened in the second century uh, in the church, and it's, it's been regurgitated and spewed up uh, in our day. And so many times the false teaching is, is simply regurgitated and comes back around. Biblical theology does this by surveying the progressive revelation of God's truth, uh, and so, you know, all of these things work together. And in systematic theology, presents the total structure of historical theology, biblical theology, uh, looking at natural theology, the creation of God, and all of these things to learn about Him. Theology proper, then, is the, uh, this course is focusing on theology proper. And theology proper does not investigate what God does, but who He is, and what may be known of His existence, person, nature, and characteristics of the triune God. So we're going to explore these areas. It does not investigate God's works or other areas in theology, but the person of God. It'll be a wonderful time. Questions or comments? Yes, sir. Uh, I have two comments for clarification. Uh, one on at the bottom of the first page, uh, the last three sentences, how theology affects my life or your life is our personal and individual responsibility. But to conform our lives to the image of Christ is the ultimate goal in studying theology. Yet in the final analysis, no book 
or Jim's course can do that. <laughs> Only God can do that. Yes, sir. And I would put a PS on that. And God wants to do that. Yes, sir. Conform me to Christ. The only limiting factor in this class is our own personal individual responsibility. Yes. But I wanted to, that God really wants to, mm -hmm. us to do that. And, and then um, the last little clarification was on uh, dogmatic theology and, and the definition of dogma. Basically, the way I understand dogma, it's the absolute truth. Yes. Scripture. Yes, sir. And, and that kind of simplified that whole thing on dogma. It does. Uh, and again, it's, it's the rock in which we build. Uh, you know, there, there are areas where uh, certain things that we, not, we learn about in Scripture uh, are essential. Uh, and absolutely necessary force. And there are other areas that we can explore and entertain, like what is heaven like? And, uh, and we, we think about those things and, and, and dream about those things and speculate about those things uh, and take pleasure in the promise of heaven and all that it means. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not th those speculations and little bit of, of what we may know about heaven or not what we build ourselves and establish ourselves on and walk, Lord, walking with the Lord. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just, just a question. This may be splitting a hair too finely. I, I don't know. But the difference in biblical theology and revealed theology? Yeah. One is the progressive revelation of God. The other is the special revelation of God. I'm not sure how to distinguish. They're, they're probably so... Uh, synonymous that there's not much distinction and difference. The only thing that is that when we talk about revealed theology, uh, it's usually in contrast to natural theology or what we call general revelation and special revelation. We actually have a chapter on, on this area. But what that means is that, uh, that what God has revealed about himself has... Um, uh, in, in many different ways, like it says in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, in those first three verses, God has spoken through prophets in many different ways. In these last days, he's spoken through his son. So revealed uh, revelation is all of those facets and manners in, uh, of which God has revealed uh, things in a special way about himself. Whether it's visions or, or audibly speaking to Abraham or to Jeremiah with a prophet, or to Isaiah in regard to prophecy. Uh, it, it kind of includes those kind of things. But biblical theology is the same thing. It's the, it's the uh, progressive revelation of those things about God that we may know. So it's very synonymous. Good, good point. Anything else? Um, yeah. So what are we, are you saying that biblical theology is what is contained in the canon of Scripture? And revealed theology is all that God has revealed about Himself through the ages, because He He did reveal Himself to some people, and He did say some things through His prophets or through His apostles, which He did not choose to include in the canon of Scripture, and which uh, we don't look at as as being Scripture, even if we were to discover another letter to the Corinthians or something like that. We wouldn't consider that Scripture. We wouldn't consider that as part of the canon. Would revealed theology contain all of that as well because it was revealed or would it exclude that? No, not technically it would not. And that's a, that's a good point. It's something that we will need to address uh, because, and, and it's one of the things that I'm sorry that I, I left off on my passage this morning before addressing uh, that some have, uh, have ex extended hospitality to angels uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a real need to, to understand and to be wary of those uh, that, um, that express receiving special revelation from God. In fact, I was uh, listening to uh, something this week on, on uh, uh, what's her name, Beth? Beth Moore. 
Uh, and basically she was talking about how God revealed and said these things to her. Uh, and the danger of that is uh, that you're putting personal experience on the level of Scripture, and it's a very, very serious error, uh, area of error that ta can take place in the church, uh, and that we need to, to be aware of and look out for. I do uh, think that the passage there in Hebrews chapter 13 is addressing the fact that there are angels that, that have... Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the Genesis 18 passage where Abraham had angels that came. And uh, so it's probably addressing that. But there's a real serious area that we need to be aware of and look out for when people come and in their various ways say or, or express that in some way they've received special revelation about God outside of Scripture and their experience becomes truth. It's dangerous. Yes, sir. Uh, to get back to Steve's question, the way I understand it, revealed theology is studying what God is revealing in the scriptures, whereas biblical thought theology would take into account the society, the history, the culture that Okay. is being addressed Good. in that book or that verse. Okay? Yes. So biblical is taking in the culture. So reveal no. will be more narrow. Reveal, yes. Yes, it would. Yeah. You would give a background dressing with biblical theology, where revealed yeah. is just what God reveals. Yeah, in, in, in biblical theology, we uh, through exegesis and that type of thing, we would exegete on the basis of the cultural and historical backgrounds uh, that, that factor into understanding of that passage. And revealed theology would be, as he's saying, the direct revelation that was, and special revelation that was given. It's good. It, that's good clarification. Thank you. Rob, you had a question or a comment? Same thing to Alan. Okay. Super. Yeah, this is good. It's good stuff. I get excited. <laughs> so it, it's, it's nice. Nice to go through this again. So, uh, thank you for coming out. So on the, the reading on the ahead of time too. The reading, Jim, we do ahead of time before we come. Yeah, if you would uh, keep up with your reading, you have your schedule there. Is there a question online? Yeah, that is one. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of maybe it's already been addressed, but how do we keep from uh, falling into what Paul says? You know how knowledge puffs up, and you know just becoming some smart theological brains. Yeah, uh, and I, I think we did talk about that earlier, how uh, if, if our theology class is just about knowledge, uh, then uh, it will become uh, labored and boring. But if it's a pursuit of knowing God, uh, yeah. then by, by the nature of that pursuit, when we see His greatness, uh, we will not be puffed up, but we will be greatly humbled. And yeah. so uh, the proper pursuit of the study of God and theology and, and getting to know Him is, is the reality that, that it brings us to the end of ourselves and to the acknowledgement that God is great and God is good and we are not. We're not God and we're not really very good. Uh, so... Uh, you know, if, if the pursuit then is to know Him, uh, then it's not going to puff us up, but to, to bring us uh, to the reality of our need for Him and uh, the wonder and beauty of getting to know a God who has desired to make Himself known to us. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was great. Thanks. Yep. So I'll do that's, one more next time. Okay, you better. <laughs> I'm on you, man. <laughs> All right. So, any any other questions or comments before we take off? Yes, Barbara. Just a comment about getting to know God. You don't just get that from reading the scriptures. You have to have a relationship with God and, and through prayer, which is not a one way street. Prayer is not a one way street. It's not just us talking. God reveals Himself to us. So you. On a, if you want to get to know God better, you better have a prayer life. And He will reveal Himself in, to you. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that again, the relationship is built upon prayer and His Word, and, and a, a, it's a personal relationship. And as long as our studies of the Scripture is the pursuit of that, that knowledge of God in, in regard to that personal relationship, uh, then it'll, it'll be healthy. And God desires to make Himself known, as Alan was saying earlier. He, he has, has expressed His desire to be our God and for us to be His people. And that's the beauty and the wonder of the new covenant that was given in Christ Jesus. He went to great ends to, uh, to have this special relationship with us. And, you know, it's just expressed so many times in Scripture. Christ is the vine and we're the branches. His life flows through us. And that's relationship. It's, it is about this relationship. And any study of Scripture, any real sanctification or spiritual growth comes in light of that relationship. And, and there's not a problem with, with uh, pride and, and exalting ourselves uh, if, if those things are in place. I mean, we're really brought to the end of ourselves and the knowledge of our need for God. And, uh, and that pursuit in itself will, will keep us on track. So, but those are good things to think about and, and, uh, and to look at. And, as we don't want to just come out of here a bunch of Theo heads that, that like to go and abuse people with what we know about the Bible. Uh, but it's about knowing God. And uh, there, there won't be pride there again if, we, if we're in humility seeking Him. Okay? Uh, I'm going to ask Pastor Hager to close us in prayer. Lord, may we be uh, rooted and grounded in love that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that we might be filled up to all the fullness of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right. Next week, the incomprehensible God. Uh, Martin, can I uh, talk with you?